Silver and Gold Show, episode number seven, the Jay Sean Sykes edition. Former Bronco, I know you guys love that. Uh, 11 games started, he started in that playoff game against the Colts in 2004, I saw. Uh, former Buff as well, obviously. Uh, he's on our, the name of our show. Pretty sure he got burned by Peyton. <laughs> uh, he's 10th in CU tackles all time, so there's there's something for you. So uh, we're uh, n- not number seven that I ho- had hoped this would be the greatest number seven of all time, Cody Hawkins. Uh, that didn't pan out really well. <laughs> Uh, obviously, the greatest part about Cody Hawkins' CU career was the Nebraska game where South Park came on and said, Cody Hawkins, he's the coach's son, so he can do whatever he wants. Yeah. And that was basically Cody Hawkins' career at CU. Besides winning that USA whatever championship thing they were having, uh, Cody Hawkins actually has a gold medal for USA football because this, uh, the qualifications for that USA thing was – you couldn't have been drafted by the NFL. You couldn't have been to an NFL practice. So he was like the worst best quarterback or the best worst quarterback, which is hilarious to me. Anyways, he won because they were playing Belgium, and I'm pretty sure Belgium doesn't know what NFL football is. I actually think it was Australia. Oh, what? A, it doesn't matter. Uh, they don't know. They know it Aussie totally rules It totally does matter. Yeah, if they're Australian, they'll just run them over with like rugby rules, right? I, I guess. I don't know. They're putting kangaroos in their pockets and stuff, call them Joey or whatever. I don't know. Anyways, welcome to the Silver and Gold Show. That's yeah. Trevor McKinney. That is Marco Mamelin. I am Jake Shapiro. This is a really special edition of the Silver and Gold Show. We had a bye week, so we had Ryan Koningsberg on. Hell of an interview we had. Uh, that'll, that'll start up in about six minutes from where I'm talking about right now. So make sure you stay tuned and listen to that one. We were really happy to have him on. Uh, first thing we want to talk about is CU Men's Basketball announced that they're going to have a scrimmage uh, 10 a.m., October 25th before the UCLA homecoming game. I went to the scrimmage last year with Marco. Uh, I was half asleep because college kids just don't wake up at 10 a.m. But that, that, was, that was a good time. So we'll, uh, we'll pro- all three of us will probably go to that, and we'll give you a little recap of what happened after the UCLA game. On uh, I guess that would be two weeks from now on the edition of the podcast. They announced that the UCLA game is going to be at noon, so noon homecoming. It's kind of a little bit early, but it's really early. Yeah. Uh, again, 6 a.m. tailgates, I guess across the street from my apartment, which is ridiculous. Uh, let's go into the season recap. We're at the mid, midpoint. Uh, this is a little short version of the midseason recap because Ryan went into it a bit. Uh, we're 2-4. and four, Wins against U- UMass in Hawaii. Hawaii? Um, uh, we could be 5-1, and one, and this is what Trevor wants to talk about most. So, I think that uh, with uh, rivalry games against CSU... I think that that's kind of a toss-up. And, of course, we always expect to be better than CSU because we're in the Mountain West, or they're in the Mountain West, and we're in the Pac-12. And um, I think that we can always pencil that one in as a win. So, okay, you're 1-0. And then we played UMass next, right? So now we're 2-0. And then uh, I think really the only team that we should have lost to this year is Arizona State. And even then, we contended. And should have actually maybe won that game, even right. though... On paper, it didn't look like we had a chance. Right, and you go and look back at the Cal game, which we should have won. You look back at the um, uh, the uh, CSU game again that we that we should have won. Um, Oregon State, we should have won. I mean, Arizona State again. We could go on and on for hours about all these games, specifically plays, um, you know, certain situations where we could have won this game. Um, or that game. And a few mistakes made in each of those games. Exactly. There were minor mistakes that cost us the game. Maybe one or two, three plays go different. And overall, maybe ten plays this entire season go different. We're 5-1 and one right now. Exactly. And I think that um, looking at that, how we could be 5-1 and one is great for the program. Saying that, hey, look at all this potential that we have and all the direction that we're, that we're in. Um, but then again, you have to look back and say, wow, I mean, we could be a top 15 team, but we're just not there yet. And I think that it speaks both good and bad to the program, saying that you know we do have this potential. We have the talent too. Yeah, and the talent and the drive that's finally back. But then again, we're just not quite there. We're still CU. We don't have the depth yet. We don't have the experience yet. And I think that uh, hopefully next year we can look back at this point and say, oh wow, we are five and one, and we should be six and zero. Oh. And that's where I want to be at least next year. But it's optimistic, I know. But. And, and that's where the team wants to be, too. I had a meeting um, with the assistant coaches this week um, in the marketing department, and 
they all believe that we have a chance to be five and one next year to start the year. You look at our schedule, you know, Nicholas State, Hawaii, you know, really weak start to the schedule. We could easily be four and oh. Marco, how do you feel about this year so far as a whole? Positives, negatives, what do you think about the year? I mean, considering what I thought this team was going to be going into the season, I gotta say overall I'm I'm extremely impressed. I mean, as Trevor said, we are two and four, but we had a chance to be five and one. We had very like li- few plays that could have gone either way and changed our season completely but I mean I did not think that our defense would be like as good as they are I'm not saying they're great but you know we, we they weren't the stomping ground that they were last year and then our offense is actually extremely competitive and very fun to watch and I can, first time I can say that since a long time ago before Cody Hawkins that's for sure and being in the Pac-12 certainly helps that but yes and our I, offense is a lot of fun to watch I think that Right now we're being optimistic as well because now we're getting into the beef of the of the schedule where we play um, USC at US, USC. UCLA comes here; they'll be ranked when they come in here. Of right course. now, they're twenty sixth in the country. In Washington's the always a solid team. Then at Arizona, at Oregon, and then first Utah. I think if we win one of those games, I'll be pretty happy where we are. Um, and if we win two, I'll be ecstatic. I think that's the general outlook before the season, though, too. Because exactly. Just, we thought we were going to have a little bit more wins than we had now because people thought that Colorado State game was a win. Right. But um, overall, I think that we have the right direction, and I'm happy with the season so far. I'm a little nervous about what the rest of the season entails, but um, overall, I'm happy at the midway point. I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty impressed. Yeah, and I think that uh, this next game, USC, is going to say a lot. Again, you know, we've said this before that this next game is going to say a lot. But I think it is because you have USC at USC. The Buffs come in as 19-point underdogs. USC is 4-2 and two on the year. They've been a really good football team. They're number 22 in the country, and it's at the Coliseum. A lot of these guys are going to, to Los Angeles to play. A lot of these guys are from the area. So uh, they're playing at kind of, you know, home, so to speak. So it's going to be interesting how this game goes, especially because Addison Gillum has been cleared to play, it seems like, and Christian Paul has been cleared to practice, and both of these guys have had concussions and have missed some time recently. And if we have those two guys back, it's going to make a lot of a, a big of a, a big difference. But you know, at the same time, you know, I kind of am, kind of am interested to see the defense play against a team that doesn't turn, turn over the ball a lot in USC and try and be opportunistic where they have been this season and continue that trend. Continuing on USC, the big point that Mike McIntyre stressed today in his Tuesday press conference was their front seven. And USC is a spectacular front seven led by number 94, Leonard Williams, who is one of my favorite players in college football. Badass, yeah. He, he wears the Justin Tuck face mask, and it is awesome. Yeah. He got in there and disrupted that uh, two-point conversion there at the end of the... Uh, the Zona game last week, which was an awesome game. If you saw that, uh, you know, two point or two two point conversions after a ridiculous drive from Arizona, they get the, the onside kick, and then they miss the field goal after they made it, and you know, Zona ends up losing, and their season of destiny comes to an end against USC. So that was a that was a hell of a game, another crazy week in the Pac-12. But you know, that's the main thing McIntyre wanted the, uh, people to look out for is Leonard Williams. The other thing was. Uh, Cody Kessler, their starting quarterback, has only one, thrown one interception this year, which is really spectacular. He's only averaging 180 yards a game, but when you can manage the game like that, that, that speaks volumes. And the other guy McIntyre wanted people to look out for was, uh, was Javarius Allen. Javarius Allen this year is averaging 130 yards a game. Last week against Arizona, he had 205 yards and three TDs. So he is a hell of a player. Um, what are you guys looking out for next week? Player-wise? On for, us, for us. For us? What are you guys looking out for next week for us? I want us to compete in the first half and hopefully keep it close. And then if we do what we always do this year where we lose it in the second half, you know, I won't be upset, but I'll accept it and hope for next week, I guess. Yeah, I, I just want to see a competitive game out there. I, I hope for the best, but we'll probably – I don't want it to sound too pessimistic. I, I – I would. I just as long as there's a competitive game out there, I'll be happy with the team. We we just. I need to see improvements week to week, and you know, putting it up with USC, who's one of the best in the Pac-12, it, it would definitely be a big step. Winning the game would be just head over heels amazing. But uh, let's let's not get ahead of ourselves. 
So what do you guys feel, uh, maybe predictions-wise this week? Do you think we're going to cover the 19-point spread that USC is favored by? You know, I have uh, Buffs losing 35-21. Um, I think that at halftime, though, it'll be around, like, 17-14. Hopefully, Buffs winning. So you're saying bet on the halftime spread. Honestly. Yeah, yes, definitely bet on the halftime spread. Uh, and then I think that we're going to just, like, we USC is a very physical team. They're bigger, they're stronger, and they have the home field advantage. And I think that... All of that playing into it will ultimately hurt us, and uh, we'll eventually drop the ball and and lose in the second half. Yeah, I think it's going to be a pretty high-scoring game. They uh, USC defense is really good, but we we're going to put up a fight. I think that we're going to lose um, forty-eight to thirty-five. Um, can't say much more than that. I feel like Sefo's going to have a real solid game. Uh, just just how he's been trending lately, I feel like he's 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 due to have a real solid game. I think uh, this uh, this game might be uh, high scoring, or it might be uh, you know kind of an average scoring game for a college football game because the Pac-12 games are crazy, and it's kind of a lot to ask us to predict something that is unpredictable, so to speak. So I, I feel like this game is going to be around 20, 20, you know, 28, 30 ish, 30 ish points to uh, to 21, 24 in that range. I really do think the Buffs are going to come in one or you know one and a half possessions, you know. Well, it's touchdown and a field goal in this game. So I feel like the Buffs have a good shot in this game. I really don't see us winning, but I, you know, I see we have a good shot in this game to, to compete, and uh, we've done that all year, so I don't see why we wouldn't again. That's about it for the start of the podcast. We're going to go right into now our interview with Ryan Konigsberg from Rivals. So get ready. Joining us on the Silver and Gold Show, episode number seven, the Jay Sean Sykes edition of the podcast. I know you like that, old Bronco player. Uh, Ryan Koningsberg from Rivals, one of my good friends here, uh, plays softball with me every Tuesday night. In fact, tonight we got our championship. First question I got for you, uh, what's your favorite piece of sports memorabilia in here? Wow, there's a lot of cool stuff. I can't choose the beer you gave me. (laughs) Um, You know... I like this old school Cubs pennant that you have right here, or or the Todd Helton bobblehead. I know I know you'll like this on the left side. We got uh, we're in my living room and we have a old black and white posters all over the place. Uh, on the left side there, that's Ryan Turner, the first Rocky signee, and they made those and gave them out on opening day, nineteen ninety three, at Mile High, and I got myself a copy. That, that is one. awesome. That is cool. So, uh, what other autographs do you have? I got Carlton Fisk, Roger Clemens, Bobby Scales, uh, second baseman, minor leaguer, Iowa Cubs. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so there we go. I got I got a few more, but uh, no CU football or basketball ones. But you know, I'd love to get myself a Darian Hagen autograph. I met with him this week. He had some good things to say about CU football, and I know you know him. Yeah, we'll have to uh, compare. Remember, Billy, I have some good CU buff stuff. I have a a stack full of gloves from when I was a kid, and I used to just go out there and give me a glove, give me a glove. I have the, uh, I have Ron Monte's glove from when he caught the uh, last second touchdown against Kansas State, I want to say 2004 maybe. Joel Klatt, no, so it wouldn't, I, don't, I don't know what year it was, but Ron Monte, last second catch to beat KSU, and I got his glove from that game. That's my, probably my best. Is that the Big 12 championship year? Was that that year? No, was it was that after that year, yeah. It was a couple okay. years later. Uh, yeah. Speaking of wide receivers here, we're going to start off with the pressing question everyone knows, our Bolitnikoff hopeful Nelson Spruce. Uh, a lot of a lot of stuff going around, uh, around uh, about him, and, you know, of course so, because he's one of the best wide receivers in the country, and he has the option of coming back next year. Uh, Ryan goes to practice almost every day, uh, or a lot of the days when he can. We have class, we all do, so it's understandable. Uh, so, so Ryan's around Nelson. What do you feel Nelson's going to do uh, in terms of coming back next year? You know, I've been going back and forth about this. There was a time where I really thought to myself, and I, I said, he's, he's going to go. I, I show up at practice, there's six scouts there, and, you know, McIntyre wouldn't admit in his presser, but they're all there to see Nelson Spruce. I, I heard from a source later on, they were all there to see Nelson Spruce. And I thought to myself, you know, he's graduating in December. He's uh, probably going to have the best gear of his career I mean it's going to be hard to top the way he started at least and I thought to myself you know he's going to go the more I think about it it's I am I allowed to say that I don't know if a white receiver is going to leave early is yeah that, you know that's okay I've been <laughs> saying on this podcast don't keep Nelson Spruce in the white box he puts him in the white box I'm going he might be Jeremy Macklin he's going he's the next what next West no, well whether so I do Eric Decker. okay yeah the whether I do it or he does it or <laughs> NFL scouts are going to do it 
I just white receivers don't go early in the draft. I, I think you know his best. If he if he continues on this pace, which would be really hard to do, but even if he did, I think the highest he would possibly go is the third round. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I think he kind of might have this realization that this college is where he's really going to shine and whether where he's going to be able to you know be the big man on campus and and do his thing. So two weeks ago, I might have said he's going. Right now, I kind of feel like he's staying. And he, his pace has slowed down mm-hmm. in terms of statistics. And people have kind of figured out that the Pac-12 defenses uh, in terms of secondaries are a joke. So that definitely does not play in his favor. But, you know, then you think along the lines of, you know, Paul Richardson went high last year in the draft, and he's buddies with Paul, obviously. There's a great picture of him and Paul high-fiving. That's my background on my phone. But, you know, so, so you, you don't know what this guy's going to do. But I kind of... I kind of agree with you uh, in terms of he has slowed down his production and it would kind of lend you to believe that he might stay here and absolutely shatter all the records he's going to shatter this year. Uh, Trevor, you got a question for Ryan? Yeah, so um, Mag is in his second year of his five-year contract, um, and we just want to know at the end of that contract, where do you think the program will be? And will Mac be here? Will see you win a Pac-12 title? Will we be ranked at all? What do you think is going to happen? That's a really good question. Um, I, I might have to take a shot at the uh, reporter who said there's no chance that McIntyre makes it to the end of his contract. Uh, that was just mm-hmm. blasphemous to me. I, th- I think the only way he doesn't get to the end of his contract is if he somehow you know makes a quick turnaround next year and ends up getting hired away to a bigger school. I don't necessarily see that happening either. So I do think McIntyre will be here all five years. Uh, I don't know if I would go as far as to say they're going to win a Pac-12 championship. That the, There's so many variables that go into that. But I think by that fifth year, fourth year, fifth year, they'll be competing. There'll be a, you know, a time in the season where you, where, you know, Buffs fans can look at the standing and say, wow, we're one game back. You know, we win this game and this game and this game. All of a sudden, we're in the Pac-12 championship. Um, like I said, it, it, you know, so many things happen. You look at the way the Pac-12 is shaking up right now. You you can't predict how who's going to go to the championship game even now, halfway through the season. So five years from now, that's even harder. But I do think there'll be a point where you where you say this team has a chance to go to the Pac-12 championship. You know, even on a smaller scale of next year, I was talking to Darian Hagan this week. I had an interview with him uh, in the marketing department, and he said to me that he truly believes that this team can win 10 games next year. And one of his main reasons for it was everyone was coming back except Tyler McCulloch. His other reason was Seppo Lufau, in his opinion, will be the best quarterback in the Pac-12 next year. How do you feel about that statement? I mean, he's obviously biased, and, and Darian's a good guy. Um, you you do look at how much, um, you know, we talked on our radio show before this season, uh, we were naming off the quarterbacks, and we were like, wow, Seppo might be 12th, and that's not even that big of an insult because of how good the quarterbacks are. But you look at how much is leaving next year, you know, uh, all the big names, Hunley, Mariota, you assume they're going to be gone. Uh, Mannion, he's going to be gone. Kelly. Kelly's going to be, yeah. Like, it, the only it, guys it, coming back are Goff and Baraducci, or whatever his name is at Arizona State. And, yeah, Anu Solomon. Anu Solomon's yeah. back. And uh, so, you, I mean, you could make a case, at least, that he's going to be one of, you know, he's going to be one of the only returning quarterbacks. Uh, of course, all those schools, Oregon, you know, UCLA, they're going to reload. So, you never know who their quarterback's even going to be, but you can bet on them being good. Um, I like what I've seen from Sefo that he's made a lot of improvements. Ten games is that's a big, big number. The schedule really does set up for them well. I think, you know, I don't who knows what's gonna happen between now and then. Before that season, I think I'm gonna predict them to go to a bowl game. Um, ten wins is that's that's some Dan, you're entering. You're 10 winning wins. a lot of Pac-12 road games. I don't want da- Darian Hagen saying ten wins, no excuses. Uh, but that's probably Dan a good Hawkins thing, though. Style. That's a good. That's a but that's a good. You know, mentality I have, because it's a little bit different than the Dan Hawkins 10 wins, no excuses. It's the McIntyre <laughs> we're going to win at the game. Right, yeah. and, and so you, you know, McIntyre would probably want him to say we're going to win 12. Right. Or 13, actually, 13 next year. But I think um, the schedule actually works out really well for them in terms of who in the Pac-12 they have at home. Um, the non-conference schedule is fairly easy. Obviously, CSU is always a toss-up, and going to Hawaii is always a toss-up. But... You'll look at the non-conference games before that season, and you'll probably write them in as wins when you're yeah. doing that. So I think that uh, next year is going to be the big turning point season. You know, I think they have to go to a bowl game next year, and I think they will. But that's going to be the season where you either look back and you say, 
that was the season that Colorado started making that turnaround or turned the corner and got over the mountain. Or it's going to be the season where you say uh, Mike McIntyre might not have been the guy. And I don't see that happening. Well, um, speaking of reloading, as you talked about Oregon and all the other teams in the Pac-12, I'm just curious, do you know uh, how we're doing as far as CU football and recruiting this year? Yeah, um, I think when people talk about CU football recruiting, you hear the word under the radar, diamond in the rough, whatever it is. And there's a lot of guys like that this year. You know, um, the Sewell kid who we didn't even have film on rivals about him. We didn't, no one had even heard of him. And you finally, you know, you get some huddle tape on him and you're like, wow, this guy can really play. How did no one had ever even heard of him? Um, And I think at this point, no one is really in a position to question Mike McIntyre on recruiting. You look at the players that he's recruited that are um, contributing, you know, Gillum, Adkins, um, Tedrick Thompson. Shea. Yeah, Shea Field. I mean, that's not a diamond in the rough guy, but you look at the guys that he's recruited and they seem to be, you know, contributing and um, he's he's been pretty right on them. The only one that you right now I feel like, I could feel I could say is a, is a true miss on a diamond in the rough is Connor Center, and I don't even want to get into that because they recruited him off of a YouTube video of him just running routes, which <laughs> it seems weird because this staff talks about how they do their due diligence all the time and they like to get guys into camps. But uh, you know I think at this point you have to trust McIntyre on recruiting. So, yeah, they don't have that big five-star, four-star even guy in this class. They've got a chance to get Tevis Bartlett out of Wyoming, who I think is the, the crown jewel, I guess, of this class, who they really, really want to get. He's a, a guy who plays linebacker um, and quarterback. And he if he didn't live in Wyoming, I think he would be a high four-star prospect. But it's really hard to judge a guy who's playing against no one. He runs around like no one's on the field and does whatever he wants. So the Buffs have told him that they're going to give him a chance at quarterback if that's what he wants. Um, but I think no matter where he goes, he's going to end up being a linebacker and a hell of a linebacker. And then the other guy who I want to talk about is Steven Montez, who they did recruit at quarterback. And uh, I actually saw him out at CU's camp, and I, I've never seen a high school prospect who threw uh, as tight of a spiral as him. He just slings the ball on a clothesline wherever he wants. Um, and he's tall, and he's pretty mobile. Once he gets some weight on, I, I really think that he's going to be good. It's going to be hard, um, and this is the way you want it. He's probably not going to factor into the quarterback discussion until Cepho graduates, where he'll be a uh, second- or third-year player, and that's how you want it as a school. You know, CU fans are starting to get into this rhythm of, oh, well, if he's good and he's a freshman, he's going to come in and play right away. That's not how you want it. You look at a guy like Kenneth Crawley, who was thrown in right away, and really struggled that freshman year, and now he's playing in his third season, which is when most schools that get good recruits put in their, you know, four-star recruits, and now Kenneth Crowley's playing great. So when CU can get into that rhythm of this guy doesn't have to play until he's a junior, that's, you know, when things are going to really start to click with them. So going off of that, is CU starting to win back Colorado in terms of recruiting? Are we going to start taking away recruits from Oregon and you know, Texas and even like CSU and then going California off of that, schools, California, yeah. yeah. And going off that, are we still branching out West towards California and Oregon and the coast? Or are we going to divulge back into the Oklahoma's and the um, Texas and that kind of area? Yeah. I think where you'll always see CU have success um, recruiting is going to be in California. There's so many players out there and um, just look at Shea Fields is a, is a perfect example of they can go get a guy like Shea Fields who has a, ton of talent who USC, UCLA, um, all those schools said, eh, we can do better. So that's where CU is going to have to do their work, and I think that's where McIntyre is doing well, is finding the guys that USC and uh, UCLA are slow playing when you come in there and you say, look, we're going we're gonna to give you an opportunity in the Pac-12 right now. And so that's, I think that's where CU has to go. Obviously, they're, just, they're always going to have people in Texas and, and down there and they even have a pipeline in New Jersey where you see guys, right. you know, coming out of, and even D.C. now. So they're going to spread out where they can go, but California and, like you said, Colorado is where they're, they're going to have the most success. I think you look last week um, and, you know, you see Starks at UCLA who was at Cherry Creek last season. You see uh, Balage for ASU, and you think to yourself, wow, if CU could have kept those guys in state. Um, this could be a huge thing. Kenny Bell at Nebraska. McCaffrey just went to Stanford. McCaffrey, there's another guy, you know. 
uh, Kane Coulter, who was at Northwestern. You Boulder look, High. Boulder yeah, High Boulder guy. High and Fairview, uh, Kenny Bell. Yeah, sorry, I just had to get that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't think you were going to go for it, but yeah. Um, so <laughs> Ryan look, went to Fairview, me and Marco went to Boulder. So. so you look at all those players and you think to yourself, wow, so you could have kept those guys, you know, where would they be now? It's kind of unrealistic to think that you're going to get every guy every year, and especially um, where the program is now when a, when a kid finds out that he can – go pretty much wherever he wants, you know, his first thought is going to be, oh, I want to go up to Boulder unless he's one of those legacy kids or someone like any of us who grew up in Boulder their whole life. Um, so it's it's going to be one of those things that you're never in. Sometimes I feel like fans get a little unrealistic thinking that, oh, when we get back, you know, uh, every in-state guy is going to want to come to see you. You're never going to get all of them. So there are always going to be a few that get away, but they are – doing everything they can. You know, they were close on Ballage. They're, they did a good job this year, um, aside from the two guys who committed to Nebraska when they were beginning of their junior year. And, uh, one, one or both of them are legacies at Nebraska, so it's hard to, to beat that. But they're doing a much better job. I, I'm sure everyone's heard the stories of, you know, they've been to every single high school in Colorado. Um, just showing their faces, whether it's, you know, they, they even play seven on seven at some of the 1A and 2A schools. They've been down there just to get their name out there. And when that school does have a kid somehow, some way they'll, you know, that coach will remember McIntyre came here when we had nobody. So they're doing their due diligence. And I think that's all you can really ask. And I think it's on the upslope. Uh, you mentioned a guy, uh, for CU who got recruited in a way I was, oh, we just saw a YouTube video, and we recruited him. Uh, I know that's happened with the basketball team where, you know, Tad's walked into a gym and said, you, you fit my mold. You're 6'5". You're a wing. I've seen you shoot three in a row. You're coming to Colorado. <laughs> Speaking of that, how is Colorado recruiting going this year? I know we just got Deleon Brown. Tyler Dorsey's made a visit. How do you feel about that in general, how do you think? Uh, do you think Tyler Dorsey has a chance of even coming here? How do you feel about recruiting this? Year? Yeah, I uh, posted on Twitter today that I had to laugh reading uh, our message board and some of the other message boards of people being like, "Oh, Dorsey loved KU. We're done. We're out of this." And I said to myself, "What did you think? Like, you thought Tyler Dorsey was going to go to KU and be like, Meh, it was all right.' Yeah. Like it's KU." I, I told the story of 2012 when I went out to to the field house to see what it, what it was all about. And I walked in there, and I swear it was like, I don't know, you know when you walk by like a graveyard or something, and you just get this weird feeling of like there's just something here that's mm -hmm. not natural? As soon as I walked into the field house, I was like, this is the craziest thing ever. And then they fill it, you know, with all those people, and they start doing all their songs, and Rock Chop Jayhawk, and then they play this video on the board, and, you know, they show Mario's Miracle, and the whole crowd goes crazy as if it literally just happened right, right there, and... It's just, it's a special place. So if he walked in there and came out and was like, nah, it wasn't really that cool, I would think that there was something wrong with his head. That being said, what it's going to come down to is whether he wants to come to Colorado where he's the guy, you know, there'll be signs on houses out here, you know, Tyler Dorsey for uh, president. What, for president, yeah, whatever it is, just the way, you know, people fell in love with the mayor. He can come here and that's going to be his thing or he can go to KU where he's going to be another five-star guy, which... That's not a bad thing, you know, you're going to go... Right, but they've had one every year. Cliff Alexander, Joel yeah. Embiid, Andrew Wiggins going back to the Twins. You know, they, I'm a Kansas, I'm been a Kansas fan my whole life. This is the first time I'm saying this on the podcast. My dad went to Kansas. But I totally agree with you in that sense that it's just, what did you think was going to happen? He's going to the mecca of college basketball, but he has the chance of coming here... What, you have a problem with me saying Kansas is the best college basketball school ever? UCLA is the best college basketball school ever. Mm. But that's, you can't call that the mecca of college basketball. Right. Their fans hardly even go anymore. James Naismith did not coach at UCLA. <laughs> John but, Wooden did. Yeah. John okay, Wooden did. that. But, you know, my point is, you know, right along Ryan's point, we've talked about this off air. Tyler Dorsey has a chance to come here and be the best basketball player in Colorado history with Chauncey Billups. That ha that's what Tyler Dorsey's name is written on if he comes here. If he goes to Kansas, he's just going to be another Paul Pierce, another Will Chamberlain. You know, that's like something <laughs> another that's like, Will Chamberlain. <laughs> right, but like, I, you know what I mean? But like, that's just, they, they have so much what, ch history and tradition. It's not the same thing. Right, there's, you know, two, two numbers or three numbers hanging from the rafters in the Courts Event Center. There's, uh, there Cliff, could be a thousand. Right. KU has their own 
Hall of Fame in the stadium. Like even Kurt so, Pander, and you and I would never blame Tyler Dorsey for choosing to go to Kansas, but you know, so I, I saw someone say something, and, and there's not many other people that that could say this. Colorado has a coach who played for Kansas, and he will openly tell you he wishes he came to Colorado. Now, is that a recruiting ploy that he just likes to pull out? Maybe, but he can say that to Tyler Dorsey, and that's his thing. So, and I'm not one to say Tad Boyle's a liar. So he can, you know, tell Tyler Dorsey, look, I went to Kansas. I wish I would have come here, you know. Look at those flat irons. Wh- whatever it is that... Look at, we got Rodney on our coaching staff. Look, yeah, look at, um, you know, Chauncey Billups. Look at the C unit. There's so many things that you can say and... That are, that are on par with Kansas and have... That, that are comparable. Not many schools right. have comparable things to Kansas. And the one thing that he could definitely guarantee that Kansas can't is that you're going to have a shot to go out of Arizona who kind of pushed you out the door a little bit twice a year. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so it's one of those things, I don't know what he's going to do, but I'm not going to blame him either way. But to think that, you know, oh, Colorado's out of it because he liked KU, you're just being naive to think that he was going to say anything else. Uh, quick one, I guess. Uh, just any other recruiting news from CU Basketball that you know about? Um, let's see. Got to keep some stuff for our premium board over there. Obviously, oh, yeah, yeah, I feel uh, right. There's, I guess I could talk a little bit about DeLeon Brown. Um, I think that's a really interesting case. People, you know, have gotten spoiled with CU recruiting, thinking that, you know, we're going to compete for four stars on every guy. Well, you look at the class that he's actually going to come into, which is 2016, and they're going to have four open scholarships in 2016. There's nothing wrong with Tad going out and getting one of those guys that he loves. Um, And I can almost see him in his mind thinking, Oh, wow, Xavier Johnson graduates. We're going to need another lefty in here. So, you know, it, it's right in the uh, the mold of a player that he likes, and who cares if he's a four-year guy who even, you know, contributes good minutes off the bench. You have to get those guys. Um, Best-case scenario, he's a, he's a four-year guy who starts for you, but you can't always expect that they're going to go and get, you know, if they have four open spots, they're not going to go and get four four five-star players. They have two, one open spot this year, and they're struggling to fill that spot. So to get a guy that, you know, is really committed and committed enough to tell them that he wants to go to prep school and, uh, you know, bulk up and get him his body more ready for the college game, I think that's a, a good pickup for them. Yeah, uh, one of the things uh, I saw interesting with this is uh, same area as Chris Jenkins. Yeah, we, we know what happened there. Not a lot of people do. There's There's a lot of... Weird things. He left the program last year. He had the potential to be a pretty good player. Uh, But this is one year. He'll be coming in, uh, Delian Brown, one year after Josh Fortune leaves. So he'll be set up. That offense will be set up for a shooter. Mm -hmm. Um, Going towards Josh Fortune, all you read about CU basketball right now is Josh Fortune and how Tad Boyle wishes Josh Fortune was on this 2014-2015 CU basketball squad. Yeah, I, I really wish Tad wouldn't have said that because now, and I've talked about this on Twitter now, every single time CU loses a game, I'm going to have to read through a bunch of people saying, oh, if we had Josh Fortune, you know, he would have knocked down that shot in the corner late in the shot clock and we would have won that game. Um, but, you know, to, to hear Tad say we haven't had a shooter in here like that since Levi Knutson, that's, that's high praise. Uh, speaking of Levi, he's killing it right now in Germany, putting up over 26 points per game, which is really cool for him. One of my favorite players to watch. I, I'm a sucker for the white guy who nails yeah, threes. I mean, who could or anyone who shoots Paul threes, Gamble. because that's my game too, yeah. But, uh, so Josh Fortune, um, is it's going to be, it works out perfectly for them to graduate ski and have him come in. Uh, and by that time, you know, he'll be familiar with the team, and he'll probably even have a chance to be a leader on the team. I know in talking to all, the, all a lot of the players in the offseason doing interviews, a lot of them had a lot of respect for him um, having played at Pitt in that conference where, you know, that's kind of, that's big boy basketball, obviously, or sorry, not at Pitt, at uh, Uh, Providence. Providence, yeah. But playing in that, uh, playing in that conference, you know, with the big boys, a lot of the players said, you know, he can cherish so much with us from coming from that side and playing that style of basketball. So I think the players already respect him. I think by next year he's going to be a leader. And you don't want to draw too many comparisons to Carlin Brown, but in a lot of senses it's a very similar situation. Mm -hmm. I got two more for you. The first being uh, 
just how do you feel overall? It's very early. Practice has just started. Uh, but how do you feel? You've been out there a few times. How do you feel about Colorado basketball this upcoming year? It's probably the the deepest roster I've seen since I've been even following the team, not even covering the team, um, which is a long time. So that is very, very encouraging. You know, you know, every single year it seems like I say, oh, the practices get, got more competitive. The scrimmages got more competitive. You know, there's hardly even a um, – Larry Bird squad out there anymore that, you know, it's just a bunch of scrubs. It's talent on talent on talent on talent. So it's fun to watch. Um, it's going to be really interesting. I know Tad Boyle really only likes to go eight deep. So even if he goes nine deep, there's a 10th guy there who at some point has had some hype around him, whether it ends up being Dustin Thomas, Dom Collier, uh, you know, Tory Miller, whoever it is, Trey Fletcher, George King, someone's going to fall out of the rotation that, you expect to be in the rotation uh, when you look at their name on paper. And that's going to be really the interesting thing to me. Um, you can go to practice one day and see a guy have an off day, and you say, oh, that's the guy who's going to be out of the rotation. But you realize there's so many, so much time left, even before conference play, where there's in non-conference play, you know Tad's going to try and get all his guys in there. Um, so everyone's going to have a chance to prove himself, but eventually someone's going to fall out. And that's been the big thing that I've been keeping an eye on. Um, there's so much guard depth that you you think a lot of people were talking about, you know, Dom Collier getting 20 minutes a game coming in here, and it's just hard to see that. You know, when you look at, you know, Ski's not going to give up minutes. It's really, he's really not going to give up minutes. Jerron was awesome last year. Jerron was, was good for a freshman. Half, yeah, XT. Yeah. So there's so many guys, and, and you look with Dom being as hyped as he was, I think Tory Miller is going to be the freshman who has more of a chance to make an impact just because he's, you know, third. He's third in line instead of being fourth in line, which is where Dom is. Um, I think Tory Miller is going to be one of those guys who is just an instant fan favorite. Kind of the way that George Frazier busted on the scene in, in football, and now he's everyone's favorite player besides maybe Tyler McCulloch. <laughs> um, but uh, you you look at that, and I think that Tory is just going to come in. And he plays a brand of basketball that you just really haven't seen at CU in a long time that, you know, he just bangs in there and uh, he throws down dunks that you think he's going to rip the whole stadium out of the ground. So that's, he's fun to watch. And I think uh, he's going to come in there and give 10 to 15 minutes a game of just giving all of his effort and, you know, banging around. And that's going to open up Josh Scott to be able to run the floor more, which you know he loves to do. And I feel like sometimes he holds back from doing that because he knows he has to save a little energy. Now he's going to be able to go, 100% 100% running the floor. I know they're trying to push the ball even more this year. And when he gets tired, he'll, they'll have a guy on the bench that they can trust to come in there, play solid defense, maybe contribute a little bit on the offensive end. And just he's a really talented offensive rebounder. So all those things, you know, like I said, I just think Tory Miller might be the guy who ends up being the, the eye-opener this year. Right. It'll be interesting how Tad uses uh, Tory Miller in his lineups just uh, – because he seems to fit with some guys, but not the guys Tad has put together in the past. So it'll be interesting what happens there. We'll definitely cover that later in the year. Uh, you know, we're still a little bit away from basketball season. But I got one more question for Ryan, and this is something he loves and I love. Uh, basketball team switched uniforms last year. Football team uh, has, there's some rumors around it that they might switch uniforms, and the contract is up for Nike in, I think, three years from now or something like that. 2015, 2016, I think, is the year. Anyways, what would your ideal, you know, uniform be for either Colorado basketball, Colorado football, if you could describe it? Wow. Um, I think I, the, the ideal helmet for the football team would be uh, a matte black helmet. And I, I don't know if you remember when they wore the throwbacks with the, the horns yeah. on the yeah. helmet. Against we use that as a Rodney yeah. Stewart show. The yeah, 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 yeah. So I want to see the matte black helmet with, uh, like, chrome gold horns. Yeah. I think that would be pretty sweet. Um, I'd love to see silver incorporated back into the football uniform somehow. Um, whether, you know, they tried the whole numbers thing with the Hawkins era, those uniforms that were so awful. I don't even want to talk about it. I hate bringing that in when I talk about silver, but I'd like to see silver come back a little bit because, you know, here we are on the, the silver and gold show. It's the, it's the school colors. So um, find a way to get that in there. Maybe it's even a, a metallic silver uh you know, uh, horn on the helmets, whatever it is, I'd like to see that in there. Basketball, I, I like the way they have the the uh, what are the hyper elites right now. I like those. Yeah. 
obviously you want to be up with whatever Nike's putting out that season, but I don't have too much complaints. I really like the grays with the buffs across the chest. Um, you just used that a little bit too much last year, in my opinion. They used to think Ryan Koningsberg, you know, a lot because, you know, we're, we're not a podcast with a huge following. You know, he is one of my friends, but uh, we want to thank him for taking time out of his day between softball and class to uh, to come out here onto the podcast. Certainly some good opinions. Trevor, what do you take away from that interview? Yeah, I know. It's great opinions, uh, great intel. I mean, he blew me away with the amount of information that he had and just, like, uh, insight. Um I'd love to have him again. Um, I, d- I can definitely speak for Jake and Marco when I say that uh, it was a lot of fun having him here. Yeah, I learned a lot. I mean, I, I thought I knew about CU Buffs basketball and football, but uh, he kind of blew me away with the amount of just common, or not common knowledge, but just things that he knows about each of our teams. Especially recruiting. Yeah, absolutely, on recruiting. Yeah, that's going to that's gonna do it this week for uh, the Silver and Gold Show, episode number seven, the... Uh... The J-, J. Sean Sykes edition of the podcast. Just a reminder, uh, follow us on Twitter, at Silver Gold Show. Follow us on WordPress, Podbean. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, uh, at JakeShap479. A lot of places to find us. Uh, something I want every Buff fan to keep in mind this week, uh, Larry Zimmer, longtime voice of the Buffaloes, uh, is having some health issues. He's in the intensive care unit. And this is going to be the first game he's missed in 21 years, and certainly he's in all of our hearts. And I want you guys to think about that going into this week. Uh, sorry to end the show on a buzzkill, but, you know, Larry Zimmer, we, yes, all, we all respect him very much. Yep. If you're listening, Larry, which we hope you are, um, but doubt you are, uh, we hope you get better soon, and uh, can't wait to hear you on 850. Yeah, so for Trevor McKinney, Marco Mamlin, uh, this is Jake Shapiro signing off, shoulder to shoulder, fight, fight, fight. Fight on, don't fight on, because that's the Trojan luck song. Uh, something we actually forgot to cover real quick. Uh, I was going to go through the Pac-12 rankings of fight songs, but we'll do that next week. So stay tuned next week when we cover the Pac-12 rankings of fight songs, because fight on is certainly, certainly on there. Uh, so shoulder to shoulder, fight, 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 go Buffs. Signing off, Jake Shapiro, Silver Bowl Show, episode number seven. We'll see you next week. You said, you said.